Good evening, folks. Good evening. <laughs> Why don't you, you, you can you can distribute your pens first. <laughs> Are you helping hand out stuff? You can hand out stuff. What is it, sweetie? Daddy. Oh my goodness. That was so nice of someone to put that to you. Did you tell her to come You better make sure you tell her thank you. Did you get a sucker too? It matches your hair. Did you tell her thank you? Make sure you tell her thank you. <laughs> okay, guys, are you going to go back to Wanda? Or mom? One of the two? Kiss it for you, kid. Here. He missed it. Oh, here it comes. He said, Did you say something? <laughs> They add some liveliness, I tell you. <laughs> oh. um, good evening, everybody. Good evening. We doing all right today? Sure. Yes. <laughs> yes. Might as well be, right? Might as well be. Um, <laughs> guys, uh, I hope that the week's been all right for you guys. I know it's been summer, so people are getting out and doing some different things, and it feels good to be able to get out and do some things. So uh, it's good to have you guys with us tonight. I do want to remind you guys of just a, or update you guys on a couple things um, tonight. Uh, one of these I was handed before the service and I forgot to read it. One of them I didn't get handed until after the service. Um, so I'll do this one first. But for those who may not know, the Fabers have moved from here in Bell uh, to an address in Kanawha City. So I wanted to make sure that you guys were aware of that. If someone wants that address, uh, I'll be sure to get it to you after the service. Uh, if someone wanted to write it down, I could read it real quick, but probably you'd rather just get it after the service. But they do have a new address. We got a change of address oh, for them. Um, it's Cindy and Heather and um, and Landon. So and that's the favor. So we got Cindy and Heather. They've got a new address uh, in Kanawha City. If you guys are familiar with the communities like between Memorial Hospital and UC, they're in one of those little communities um, over there. So yeah. So uh, remember them uh, as they continue that moving transition process. They're into the house, but they're still getting a lot of stuff done. Uh, so remember that. And then also, um, Logan, uh, which of course would be Jeannie's grandson, uh, who graduated high school uh, this past year. Uh, what we did with all the weird COVID season, we had a few kids that were connected to us that graduated. So we, me and Kevin went out and got like a graduation gift and we sent it to all of those um, students. And so we got a thank you card back from Logan. This is Jeannie Johnson's uh, grandson. This is Dear Pastor Jonathan and Witcher Baptist Church. Thank you so much uh, for celebrating with me. I really appreciate your generosity. Uh, I keep the Bible that you gifted me on my desk. And then we got them each a Bible and a devotional book and like a 2021 mug. It says, my girlfriend and I are planning on going to church in Morgantown when I start school. So thank you again for all of the gifts. Love, Logan. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I read that to you guys. I plan to do that again Sunday as well. But I thought I'd go ahead and read them um, for this evening. Uh, it's always nice to know those little notes uh, of people that were, you know, making an impact on them. Maybe we don't even realize that the church is touching in different ways. So um, continue to remember uh, him as he is going to be starting college in the fall and looking forward to get plugged into a church up there. He's a good young man. If you guys haven't got the chance to know him very well, he's a, he's a very good young man. It gives us hope for the future when we meet young men like that, and that's a good thing. And guys, before we do get started tonight, um, a thank you to Kevin for filling in for me last week. I finally got to finish um, his Bible study that I got to watch online. It's weird to be participating by watching online, but it was good to be able to do so. I really appreciate Kevin filling in for me while we were going at camp. Uh, I think he did share with you already, but I'll share with you again. We had at least eight professions of faith at camp, and that was just a wonderful week. Uh, just a really good time. The state had not had a youth camp for at least a decade. Uh, someone had told me they thought it had been about 15 years or so since the state put on a youth camp. So it was really, really good that they were able to do that. And we were just uh, privileged to be able to be a part of it. And of course, God moved in a good way. So we're just excited um, about that. I know it was really good for our three students that went. Um, Hendrix got to go. Um, Evan Cart, Wanda's, uh, I want to say grandson, but that is not your grandson. Your grandnephew. Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Uh, I try to connect family trees. Um, he got to go, and then, of course, Xander got to go. Uh, and it was a good week for all three of those kids. So uh, we're, we're excited about that. Um, guys, as far as our calendar and stuff coming up, this Sunday is a family Sunday, so it's not going to be children's church. It doesn't affect any of you guys, really. Um, but the kids will be in service, and then we're going to ask you guys to bring your own picnic lunch. 
Uh, for you guys, the church is going to provide a drink and a sweet, and we're going to have some games and hang out after service just to continue to kind of uh, rebuild that, uh, that social connection we've kind of missed during the COVID season. So that's this Sunday. Uh, another uh, The Sunday from now, uh, a week from this coming Sunday in the evening, uh, we are going to have a business meeting on the 18th uh, at 6 and then on the 25th, the last um, Sunday of July, uh, we are going to be having a guest musician with us for our outdoor service. Uh, if the weather is not permitting, it will be inside and we'll still have our guest uh, musician with us. So I wanna make you guys aware of different things that we've got coming up. Um, with all of that being said, uh, are there prayer requests that we can lift up this evening before we do get into um, our Bible study? Remember Leah, right? Like um, how many chemo treatments is she into now? Do you know how many she's, she's no, had? I don't. I think she's just been in the hospital a couple of weeks, but I don't know. Okay. I knew that she just started and it, was, yeah. it had been but rough. She's still in the hospital. Okay. Okay. Um, others tonight? Or updates? Tim, you have an update for us for Miss Ramona? Uh, she's doing a little bit better. I think where she bruised her rib the other day when she fell, it's much better. She was able to start her first day of physical therapy today. And she really, she knew this therapist and she really likes him. He did a few things with her today. So okay. Main thing is to keep her oxygen. But, okay. Because uh, she's had to have an alcohol for seven. She didn't think she had to, but she's found out she has. Gotcha. Pray for that transition. And uh, Marty Blankenship called me couple days ago. He's the guy that had the, he has a colostomy bag now and the, and the bladder bag. And it's, it's been a big change for him. He's had, but he goes back to work with Walker on Monday, so he just asked for prayers for that and how he might be able to handle that. And he, he's not saved either, so. Okay. Others this evening? Yes. Well, this past week there's been three people that's finished up their chemo and they don't have to have any more. And mm. I told them I just put them in the church. Now, God knows their names, but they're really happy. Oh, then, absolutely. And then there's one lady that she's doing really well, but she's she's been coming for, I think, almost a week, every, a whole year. Okay. But she's doing, she looks great. Good, okay. good. It's nice to celebrate that, right? Yes. I told them they let the people know there's one that checks me in out downstairs. I said, they'll sing to you when you leave. <laughs> there are good things happening in the world. We always have to make note of those and look to those. Um, others this evening? Jonathan, I have a praise. I, I do find a landing spot at, at work and I do get to stay here. I don't have to move at this time. I don't know if this is my final landing spot, but this is where I am now. But just continue to pray for my coworkers because there's still a lot of turmoil and anxiety going on within the organization. A lot more changes is coming too, so just, just pray for, for those that haven't found a landing spot that they will soon. Well, too, Belinda, we're glad that you don't have to be far from us. Any others this evening? Absolutely. In a sport family, that's a hard news the to hear. The doctor actually encouraged them that as soon as he's old enough to get in some type of okay. activity like that just to continue. They said they didn't really care what it was, just somewhere where he could okay. use his muscles continually. Okay. So. Well, good. I'm glad that's not a hindrance. I was afraid when I heard that that, that might be yeah, an eliminated thing. Yeah, like ride a bike. Some things could be, but it's just okay. kind of be a trial and error thing. Okay. But I also talked to Brittany just a little bit ago, and they have a family friend who was in a pretty tragic accident a couple days ago. Um, they're not ready to release his name or problems yet, but it's, it's a very grave situation, so. Okay. Any others tonight? 
Yes, Miss Paisley? Who's really sick? A, a little girl in the hospital. Oh yes, there is a little girl. Mm -hmm. um, continue to remember us for our journey. Everything's going really well. Uh, for Cora, everything is going well there. Um, I think you guys know by now, but I'll just refresh your memory that they did decide to remove um, the rights of the parents a couple weeks ago. So we're moving towards that adoption process. We're meeting with a lawyer this Friday uh, to see what we have to do to get paperwork and stuff ready for that. So just continue to pray that that process continues to go smooth. Uh, we're looking forward to the day where she's eventually uh, an official little Eubank. So keep praying that that goes well uh, in the weeks and months ahead. Any other requests tonight? Unspoken requests? Let's pray. God, as we come before you, we just thank you to be able to gather together tonight. God, I thank you for the people that are in this room. Continue to strengthen them. Father, in the, the things that they're facing day to day, uh, week to week, God, just continue to encourage them and provide, them what, for, or provide for them, Father, what they need. God, we pray for the names that we've mentioned. We pray for Leah Blake um, as she continues to be in the hospital. And Father, it looks like she has a long road ahead of her. God, we just pray that you'd be with her, that you would sustain her and strengthen her and help her. God, we pray that you continue to be with Ramona and with Tim. Um, we thank you that she's been able to, to realize she needs to be on oxygen, but help her with that transition um, as that, that takes some time to get used to. Help her with that. Um, continue to be with Tim as he cares for his mom and give him the strength that he needs. Um, God, we pray for Marty Blankenship as he's expected to start back to work um, after having some serious health concerns and uh, some major changes. I pray that you just be with him, um, that you would strengthen him, that you would help him uh, in that transition, uh, Lord, and you might work and move in his life spiritually as well. God, we praise uh, you for the three that were able to finish their chemo, uh, God, we thank you for so many people in this church whom you've carried through um, a season of cancer in their life. And God, we just pray you continue to sustain them and strengthen them. God, we praise you for Belinda not only having a job, but having a job that means that she's close to us. She doesn't have to be far away. God, thank you for your provision. Every job uh, in this room that's represented, God, is you providing for us. We thank you for that. Continue to be with all those who are struggling that haven't found a, a place yet. God, just help them and be able to provide and open doors for them uh, to meet the needs of their families and themselves. God, we pray for uh, for Kayla and uh, for the family as uh, they've got that news about low muscle tone. We just pray that you'd be with that. Uh, maybe that's something we can look back on a couple of decades into the future and be like, that was such a silly thing to hear about because it hasn't slowed him down from being able to do anything. God, that's our prayer. That, 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 would, that would not be a hindrance um, for him and for his future. God, we pray for the friend of Brittany that's in a tragic accident that we don't know details to. God, you know, and we just pray that you'd be in that situation. For the little girl that's in the hospital, Lord, continue to provide for her as well. God, for the unspoken request tonight, uh, for the things that are heavy on our hearts, we just pray that you would see um, that you would move and that you would work. And God, we would not cease to give you praise for whenever you answer these requests. God, bless our time together tonight. We ask these things in the name of Jesus and amen. amen. <coughs> um, tonight, we're going to be in Jonah. Now, I imagine if it comes to an Old Testament prophet, Jonah is one that you're probably the most familiar with. Anybody ever heard of Jonah and the Big Fish? Anybody, right? You guys a little bit familiar with that? Uh, I would hope that you guys are familiar with that, but I think that as we look at this a little bit tonight, hopefully it kind of takes on new significance as we kind of drop it down into this greater big story of what God has been revealing to us about himself from creation up to this point. Uh, now, I want to do a little bit of a re review. It's going to take a couple more minutes here uh, since I missed out last week. I want to add a couple of things in there, but this is the big picture, right? This is what we've done all year so far. We're halfway through because we're, we finished June, we're into July. 
Uh, we're halfway through our Bible, so we're almost done with the Old Testament, so we're going to be jumping into the New Testament very soon. But we know that God created the whole world, right? He created everything. It was good. Uh, but the first man and the first woman rebelled against God. Sin entered into the world, and with sin uh, came great suffering and death. Every time we have a request for suffering and discouragement uh, and health issues, all of that is a result of the sin of Adam and Eve. So God created everything good and perfect. We rejected uh, God, and so all of the mess we see in the world is a result of that. Uh, and even though that is what mankind has done, God would continue to be gracious to us. Uh, he reached out to creation through a covenant he made specifically with Abraham. Uh, God would raise up a people for himself through the line of Abraham. He'd give them instructions for life, such as the law. He would warn them about the price of disobedience. Uh, and a promised king would rule forever one day, opening up the blessings of God to all families on earth. Again, as we might think of them being um, present for Adam and Eve in the very beginning. Yet even in spite of all that God had done, God's people rejected God, and they broke the covenant. Even their best king sinned greatly. We think of David, of course, and Bathsheba. Uh, as a result, they were removed from the land that God promised to them. All the curses for breaking God's law fell upon them. It was not a great uh, moment in their history. And so Kevin talked some about that uh, last week. So I want to review just a few things from the prophets. In Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 17, it says, "'Have you not brought this upon yourself?' By forsaking the Lord your God where he led you or when he led you in the way. So he said, all of these things that are happening, you can't point to God and say, God, it's your fault that things are happening the way they're happening. God, why would you allow things to happen? Whenever we hear the words of God through the prophet in Jeremiah, he says, you have brought this Israel upon yourself. Judah, you brought this upon yourself. You are the ones who have rejected the ways of God. Jeremiah 3, 22 says, return O faithless sons, and I will heal your faithlessness. God is still being gracious. He says, if you will return, if you'll turn back, uh, repent to that word we think of. I'll heal your faithlessness. Despite all of the things that they have done against God, God still made good news promises through the prophets. Uh, Isaiah 51, 11, the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. He says people are going to return to Jerusalem. Even though they're away from the promised land now, that's not the end of the story. Uh, the Lord promises a servant who will take all of our iniquity upon himself, and in so doing, he's going to make many righteous. So the, well, there's this prophecy that a servant of the Lord is going to come that's going to remove our sins from us. He talks in Ezekiel 37 26, I'll make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them. Now, the thought that God's going to make a covenant of peace where at the moment they're experiencing his wrath is a big deal. God says, I'm going to make a covenant with you. The last time they should have heard of covenant, they're thinking of the promises of David, the promises to Noah, the promises of Abraham. God has not forgotten his people despite their faithlessness. That's a big deal. It teaches us a lot about the goodness of God. I want to do one more thing for review, and then we're going to look at Jonah. Uh, the biggest thing that we see perhaps from the prophets is this promise of this new covenant. We get a little bit of a description of this covenant in Jeremiah 31. 31 through 33 it says behold the days are coming declares the lord so whenever we read that in the prophets it was still in the future that god was going to make this covenant uh, when i will make a new covenant with the house of israel and the house of Judah. now think about that it, it, he describes the first one as like a marriage contract a marriage that they broke a covenant that they broke and now he's saying even though you've been unfaithful israel i'm going to form a new covenant or a new agreement a new marriage contract of sorts with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke. So the important thing about the prophets that we should take away is that God's people broke the covenant God made with them. Despite their faithlessness, God is still faithful and promises a new covenant in their future. That's what I want us to take away from that. So now we're going to talk about Jonah. Here comes this prophet on the scene. He's a prophet. He is listed in the Bible uh, as a prophet. The word of God comes to him. That's a saying that's used for people that are prophets in the Old Testament. He's listed in the portion of the Bible that's considered the minor prophets in the Old Testament. So this is a prophet of God. 
Now, when we think about a prophet of God, maybe we think back to Samuel, a great uh, faithful prophet of the Lord. Maybe we think of, to, of another one, whether it's Isaiah that we just mentioned or Jeremiah that we just mentioned. When we think prophet of the Lord, this is a person that represents the Lord well, right? That should be a, uh, something that we think about when we hear the word prophet. And that's not exactly what we're going to find when we come to this little book. Uh, interestingly enough, whenever I was in college, uh, some, uh, some scholar circles would say that they wonder why Jonah is even in the Bible at all. Uh, because it, it's a short book, it talks about a prophet that isn't the most obedient on the face of the earth, and it kind of ends very abruptly. Uh, some have even went so far to argue that they don't think it needs to be in the Bible uh, at all. And I would submit to you that it is in the Bible for a very good reason. We see that God's people have been plagued with sinfulness, whether that's before he made the covenant with Abraham, when, with Adam and Eve, whether it's after he made the covenant with Abraham, even David's sin. Here we see how bad sin has affected mankind. There's no one that's exempt from it. Even prophets that are supposed to be representatives of God can be plagued by sin. And we're going to see that's exactly the case uh, for this prophet. We're also going to learn some very important things about God from this book. So chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, it says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, call out against it, for their evil has come up before me. Now this should be a job a prophet should want, because these are people that have been part of the, the group of people that would have oppressed uh, the nation of Israel. So a prophet should be excited that God is about ready to pour his wrath on someone other than his own people. This is not the response of Jonah. Verse 3 in chapter 1, Jonah rose to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Usually when I've heard this, if you look on the map, if you look at Nineveh and you look at Tarshish, Tarshish is like the opposite direction. They're like Jonah just turned away and went the exact opposite direction of the way God wanted him to. But to me, the most important thing here in verse 3 is that Jonah was trying to get away from the presence of the Lord. Hear that for what it is for a moment. If we think about Adam and Eve, whenever they had sinned and God comes to the garden, right? He walks in the garden and then they hid themselves. They removed themselves from the presence of the Lord. Here is a prophet whose job is to hear from the Lord and then to do what the Lord has said. He hears clearly what God wants him to do and he tries to avoid what God is asking him to do. I think this book is in here to show us how sinfulness affects all of us, and also we can relate to this guy. It's not so much that we don't know what God wants us to do sometimes, it's that we just don't want to do what he wants us to do. In verse 9 of chapter 1, uh, we see he's going to flee on a boat. Uh, it's going to be a tempest. There's going to be a storm that happens. And so they're trying to figure out someone on board must be to blame for this. And so uh, they pray to all their gods. Things aren't working. They're like, they, they, they talk to Jonah. They said, who are you? Where are you coming from? What's, what's the this, this story here? Well, this is what Jonah says uh, in chapter 1, verse 9. I am a Hebrew, so they know that he's now amongst the people of God, of Israel. Uh, I fear the Lord. Now, that's a pretty interesting statement for a person to say that's fleeing the presence of the Lord. He says, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. When they hear this, they're like, okay, you're the reason why we're in this storm because you feel the God that you say uh, you believe in is the God who made everything. And so this is the reason why we're in this mess. And so Jonah tells them, in order for you to get out of this storm, in verse 12, you're going to have to pick me up and you're going to have to hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will quiet down for you, for I know it is because of me that this great tempest has come upon you. We should never think that when we sin, the effects of that sin stay with us, because rarely do they ever. Usually when we are disobedient to God, it does not just affect us. It affects those immediately around us, and sometimes it affects way beyond even those people. Jonah knows this. Jonah knows he's the one that's caused this mess. He says it. He admits it right here. He says, throw me into the sea. I'm the one who's brought this upon you. What we're going to see is a prophet in need of salvation. Because the Old Testament, if it is to do nothing else, it is to do this. The Old Testament is to reveal to every one of us that we are in desperate need of a Savior. 
We're in desperate need of salvation. Even the prophets of God are at the mercy of the salvation that comes from God. In chapter 2, verse 1, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. When I read that verse, it's almost like, okay, now that Jonah's in a big mess, this is where Jonah prays to the Lord. Uh, have we ever been in that ourselves, right? Like things are going okay, and so maybe our prayer life isn't as, as good. When things are kind of not going great, then we're like, okay, Lord, we, <laughs> well, I need, you, I need you to show up. I need you to do something here. So Jonah prays to the Lord from the belly of the fish. This is the person that he clearly heard from, but he didn't want to do what God asked him to do. The end of verse 6 and verse 7, it says, You brought up my life. From the pit, O oh Lord my God, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. He talks about I me mean, that my, if my life is to be spared, it is going to be by the Lord. He hears the prayers that I call out to him. Verse 9 um, I will, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you what I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Uh, he, he's learned something vital from this storm that he has endeavored. Not just the storm, but he's in the middle of a fish. That's a storm of its own uh, account. But he understands in the belly of this fish, listen, salvation belongs to God. If I am to get out of this mess, it is going to be from God. This is an important thing that even prophets need reminded of from time to time. Chapter 2, verse 10, the Lord did indeed hear his prayer because he wasn't finished with Jonah. The Lord spoke to the fish and vomited Jonah out onto dry land. Now, I'll tell you something. Uh, I don't get squeamish about a lot of stuff. I hate vomit. It is like the worst thing on the face of the earth. I know for a fact that I prayed to the Lord when I've been sick that I would rather have diarrhea for a week than to vomit once. I hate it, okay? I do. I do. It is the worst thing. But whenever we come to I me, mean, I can't imagine being spit up out of a, a fish's mouth onto land. I mean, to think about this, this isn't just a, a story. It's not like a, an illustration in a children's book. This is something that happened to this person. I mean, it's incredible. And this is something that happened to a prophet of God. We might think that there are people that maybe they represent God so well, they are immune from from consequences or they're immune from bad things or difficult things happening in their in their life there is no such thing taking place here in the story of jonah uh, god is going to call i would submit to you not uh not only this city but jonah also to repentance but god specifically is going to use jonah to call an entire city to repentance and so he's going to send finally jonah's going to listen Chapter 3, verse 2, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, call out against it the message that I tell to you. This must be the message in verse 4 that God said, because this is what Jonah said. Forty days, yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. It's going to be overthrown because of the wrath of God. Chapter 3, verse 5, an interesting thing happens. The people of Nineveh believed God. Now, it seems like they're doing a better job respecting God and fearing God than the prophet of God is in this verse. The people of Nineveh believed in God. They called for a fast. They put on sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. The, the king leads in this. He tells everyone in verse 8, let everyone turn from his evil way and from violence that is in his hands. Who knows, this is verse 9, God may turn and relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. What we see here is all of Nineveh decides that they are going to turn from their evil ways, they're going to repent, and they're going to say, who knows, God may decide not to bring this, this devastation if we would turn to him. And what does God do in verse 10 of chapter 3? It says, when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil way, God relented of the disaster that he had said he would do to them, and he did not do it. Now, this is a whole city that was about to receive the wrath of God. Now, when we think of what that did to Jerusalem, one city, the very city of his own people, where the temple used to be, when we think of what the wrath of God did to one city, 
we see a foreign city, a pagan city, a city that had been part of the oppression of God's people, and they repent of their ways, they turn to God, and God does not bring disaster upon them. There's a lesson here uh, for any country on the face of the earth. I think there's an important lesson here uh, for the nation of America in which we live. If we were to understand, to recognize, and to turn from our sin, some of the mess, a good bit of our mess, I think would be healed and restored. And we should pray for that. We should pray for us to be agents of that. Now, this is what should have happened in chapter 4. It's not what happens. It's what should have happened. The prophet should have said, okay, I did what God sent me to do. And the prophet should have been overjoyed that people repented of their sins and turned to God. And that is not what we find in chapter 4. In fact, the very first verse tells us this. It displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was angry. Jonah was angry that people repented of their sins and turned to God. This is a prophet of God that's upset. Now, it might be easy for us to look at Jonah and be like, now, Jonah, you just don't get it. Jonah, you just don't understand. Now, I want you to think for a moment of a person that has hurt you deeply. I want you to think of a person that has done something to you. Perhaps it was over years of life. Uh, has done something to you. There, maybe there's a grudge. Maybe there's something there. Whatever. I want you to think of someone that has intentionally done something to hurt you. And I want you to think about that person being welcomed easily into the arms of God and God forgiving that person of all of their sins. Are you okay with that? Are you happy for that person? that all of their sins are forgiven, that whatever they did to hurt you, God allowed that person to have forgiveness for that? Does that hurt a little bit? Perhaps you feel that it would have been nice for you to have executed your own judgment on that person rather than God pardoning, pardoning them. In this instance, Jonah is upset because he believes this city does not deserve grace, but deserves the wrath of God. And this is why Jonah is upset. In verses 2 through 3, notice what Jonah says. O oh Lord, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. Now we get some insight into why he left in chapter 1. What we see is that he already had a conversation with the Lord. And he said, Lord, is this not what I told you would happen? I was afraid that you would be gracious, and that's why I did not want to come. This is what Jonah is saying. He said, I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster. Therefore, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Now, we might think that Jonah is being awfully dramatic here, and that is part of what's going on. But notice what a prophet of the Lord has said. Earlier in our Old Testament studies, uh, part, part of this was whenever Moses and God had a, a great transaction. Part of this is whenever we looked at the prophets. One of the best characteristics of God is what Jonah just criticized in this chapter. It says, God, I knew that you were a gracious God and merciful. He's not saying this because he's glad God's gracious and merciful. He's saying, I only want you to be gracious and merciful when I want you to be gracious and merciful. God, you're slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. He says this as a criticism. Do you understand that? He's saying, God, you're slow to anger. We love it for God to be slow in anger to us. We love for God to be abounding in steadfast love towards us. But what about when we don't want him to be slow to anger or, or to be abounding in steadfast love towards people who have hurt us? You're relenting from disaster. All of these things are considered some of the best characteristics of God mentioned in all of the Old Testament up to this point. It's the reason why God is so good. And in this 
instant, Jonah uses it as a criticism, as the reason why he did not want to go. God, you were gracious when I didn't want you to be gracious, merciful when I didn't want you to be merciful. You were not angry when I wanted you to be angry. You showed love where I did not want you to show love. You decided not to give disaster when I wanted you to give disaster. Just kill me. That is what Jonah is saying. Chapter 4, verse 4, the Lord leaves this book in the Bible to teach us something about ourselves. Chapter 4, verse 4, the Lord says, do you do well to be angry? The Lord is trying to teach Jonah something through this as well. Not only is he gracious towards the city of Nineveh, but he's saying, Jonah, is it, is it good for you to be angry about what you're angry about? Sometimes in order for us to be made more into the image of God, we need what we get angry about to be corrected. We can get angry about things that are little and small and trivial and not be angry over the fact that we're doing nothing to share the grace of God through his son that has already come. We can get angry about things that affect us and not angry about things that hurt other people. We might not even notice it at all. Uh, Also in this story, what we're going to see is that God gives him another opportunity. So Jonah goes to see what's going to happen to the city, uh, and God allows a plant to grow, and it shades Jonah, and Jonah's excited about the plant because it shades him. And then God also allows a worm to come and destroy that plant, and then the sun comes, and a scorching heat comes, and then Jonah's upset and angry again and pretty much asked to die again. And so we hear this question again from God towards Jonah, chapter 4, verse 9. God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? He says, Jonah, you're upset because this plant isn't giving you shade, but you do not care about the spiritual well-being of the entire city of people that I sent you to spare. That's what's going on in the book of Jonah. Unfortunately, I think we, we see ourselves in Jonah a little bit more than we'd like if we really paying close attention. What do we learn about God from this? I want to share two things from this uh, because I I want to be sensitive to our time together. What are two things we learn about God? God is in control of this entire situation. So Jonah hears from God and says, I'm just not going to do what you want me to do, God, and he runs away. Does that change God doing what God wanted to do? Not at all. If God determines to do something, it will happen. If he has to send a fish after you, a storm after you, it is going to happen. Make no mistake. God is in control. The word appointed in the ESV translation is found at least four times throughout this book. In chapter 1 verse 11, the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Is God in control of that? Absolutely. Chapter 4 verse 6, the Lord appointed a plant to save him from discomfort. Now now notice, God sent a fish to teach Jonah a lesson. God sent a plant to comfort him to keep him from discomfort. Chapter 4, verse 7, God appointed a worm to attack the plant. So then God sends something to attack what brought him comfort. Chapter 4, verse 8, God appointed a scorching heat, wind, and sun. God sometimes allows things that are difficult for us if it's going to grow us. And that's absolutely within God's power to do, and it's good for him to do that to us. It's good for him to do that for us. God is in control of this entire situation. Does the entire city still get grace? Absolutely. Does Jonah learn anything from this lesson? I hope, but we don't know. We're going to have to ask him someday because the the, the end of this this, uh, book, it it ends with a question of God to Jonah, and, and basically it's for us to answer as well. Here's the other thing we learned. God's not only in control, God is more gracious than us. And that's a good thing. God is more gracious than us. Sometimes we like to think, we look at our lives and we look at things, if I was only in control, if only I called the shots, things would be better, things would be different. Guys, it's much better for God to be in control because he's more gracious than we are. Chapter 4, verse 10 says, you pity the plant. God says, you're pitying this plant because you want shade. And then verse 11 of chapter 4, should not I pity this city of Nineveh? And that's where the story of Jonah ends. He's trying to teach Jonah a lesson. He says, you're upset about this trivial thing, and should not I, the God who has made all creation, have pity on a city of 120,000 souls that need repentance, that need turn from their sins? 
There's a, there's a big picture of what the world needs and what God can give that the prophet Jonah needs reminded of. It's very important for us to get that as we kind of come to our end of the Old Testament and we're going to open the New Testament and see how God provides that grace and that salvation uh, in his son. See, this should always be the big picture for us. Despite all the things we have to do in the day, despite all the things that we have to try to figure out, we are a people that need the salvation of God. And once we have received it, we should pity people who have not had it. And that should be something that presses us forward rather than things that only deal with us. That's something that the story of Jonah is all about. So I want to share one final slide. It won't be long, I promise. And we'll be out of here for tonight. But what about Jonah in the New Testament? Some people, again, they take this book of Jonah and think it's just a story. They think it's maybe just a fable. Some have went so far as to say this isn't a really a literal account. It's just a, a good story that teaches a moral lesson. I think that when we come to the mouth of Jesus, he would tell us that the book of Jonah is a literal event that actually happened. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 41, we find this in the New Testament. It says, Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. And he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the hearts of the earth. So Jesus is saying a sign from God that I am a representative of God is that I'm going to spend three days in the earth and I'm going to spend three nights in the earth. And then, of course, we're going to know the resurrection on Great Easter Sunday. But he makes this comparison to Jonah as if he knows that this happened as a real, literal event. The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. He says, Nineveh learned a lesson in the Old Testament that the people of Jerusalem and the surrounding areas of Jewish people have not learned while the Messiah is in their midst. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah and behold, something greater than Jonah is here. Now, when we think of the, the greatness of Jonah, it's not in regards to the person or the character of Jonah. It's in regards to the fact that a prophet that goes to a city and 120,000 people repent is a pretty big deal, right? And it had nothing to do with Jonah being a great person. But someone greater than Jonah is here. Those who repent and turn to Jesus will number in who knows how many. And what Jesus wanted his people to understand that day is he is a person who has come that offers full and true repentance to all who will receive it. So the story of Jonah is not only something we find in the Old Testament that teaches us something about ourselves, but also it is something that Jesus uses in the New Testament to show that repentance is really here. What the world is looking for, salvation has come in the person of Jesus. So guys, we are almost finished with our time in the Old Testament. We look at Malachi uh, next week. Uh, and then we're going to be in the New Testament looking about how all the things that God has been doing throughout history are going to be fulfilled. And then we've got a few things we wait to be fulfilled in the future. Guys, any thoughts, any comments tonight before we, we close our time together? Good old Jonah. Or not so good Jonah. <laughs> Could be dangerous. What could be dangerous? For not living for the Lord. Not living for the Lord could be absolutely dangerous. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, if you know something, it's almost he's... unbelievable, but I really believe it's true too. You can tell someone outside of that. Well, uh, I think of some situation. I'm thinking some situation I'm talking to myself. I've experienced it. It way over there. <laughs> it got my attention. Yeah. Um, we should take seriously what we know God has asked us to do. Right? We should take seriously what we know He has asked us to do. Any other thoughts or comments before we close tonight?
I think it's interesting that, uh, you know, God uses people in the Bible like uh, David, King David, uh, like Jonah, uh, people that, you know, they didn't do everything perfect. Yeah, we don't have to be perfect to be used. And, you know, here's Jonah being mad at God because he saved all them people, you know, which is the thing about totally, you know, amazing that he would do that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and then we have King David who, he was such a wonderful king, but yet, you know, he just uh, messed up. Sure. And, uh, you know, thank the Lord that he, you know, he realized that he had done something wrong and he he knew that he had betrayed God and uh, sinned against him. We do see the repentance of David. Yeah. It would be curious to know the response of Jonah after after yeah. this, right? Yeah. Because we do not know. We, we hear no more of this story. Yeah, you don't hear anything else on Jonah, do you? No, That's perhaps true. to be continued in heaven. I'm not sure. <laughs> Yeah, maybe, maybe when we get up heaven, we get to ask him. <laughs> the Lord what? still used his preaching, even in his disobedience, to save souls. Yeah. He did. So was the power in Jonah, or was the power in God? I think no, the power, the power in, God. in God. Yeah, right. Right. It should humble every minister. <laughs> yeah. It should. <laughs> Guys, let's bring our time to a close tonight. Let's pray. God, thank you for including the story of Jonah in the Bible. God, for us. God, in our pure honesty before you, sometimes we've been upset of how you've handled things. Perhaps that we thought we could do better or things didn't go or you allowed things into our lives the way we would not do that for ourselves. But God, help us to learn that you are not only in control, but you're more gracious than us. Father, that includes the things that you allow in our lives to teach us lessons, to humble us. God, you know that that's what's best for us. And so, God, help us to trust your grace towards us, even when we're not very gracious towards others. God, help us to understand that we don't have to be perfect to be used. But, God, I pray that you would give us um, a a lesson learned from the, the story of Jonah, that, Father, we should be so thankful when any person repents and turns to you. Father, even if they have a bad past, even if they come from a life that may have hurt us or harmed us, God, may we want for them, for them to find salvation in you. Because Father, without it, they'll be lost forever. And we should appreciate the grace you've already extended to us. God, whenever you ask us to do something, may you find more quick and happy obedience from us than from Jonah in this story. God, be with us, encourage us, grow us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, and amen.